I'm in the Persian Gulf. It's May. It's 9 p.m. and it's 30 degrees Celsius. I'm in Dubai Dry Dock and it is vast. I'm working on a large tanker that's docked for maintenance and I'm the only female at the table. In fact, I'm the only female on the ship and one of five females in the shipyard. 10,000 men work here and I'm right in the middle of it. For 10 years, I traveled the world as a marine engineering officer in the Merchant Navy. And for nine months of one year, I did not see another female or a child. Only a handful of females had achieved the same qualification by the time I sat my chief engineer's exams in the history of Ireland. And I was the first female to take an engineering position in not one, but two Irish companies. My name is Claire O'Connor, and today I invite you to come on a journey with me. My story starts when I was seven years old on an incredible hot summer's day in Cork. The sun was shining, the garden hose was spraying, all of the neighborhood kids were in my parents' garden, us smallies in our swimming togs, the older teens up the back sunning themselves, my mother ironing on the patio. I jumped the wall to my next door neighbor's garden where their teenage daughter was teaching me how to hang socks on the clothesline. You got to love 80s Ireland. She asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up. I'm going to be a train driver, I said, delighted with this idea. But she looked down at me and laughed and she said, oh, Claire, girls can't drive trains. I knew there was something not quite right here because I had no physical reason to say that I couldn't drive a train. I'd seen my mother and my teachers driving cars. I'd even seen my grandmother driving tractors, so surely it couldn't be that different. I didn't actually want to drive a train specifically at that time, but it was the biggest machine that I had ever seen and I was in awe. Thus began my love for engineering, exploration, and rebellion. Fast forward 10 years, and I had fallen in love with the idea of studying marine engineering. I'd finally found something adequately thrilling and different. And on my very first day of college, I knew that I had found my tribe and my passion in another strong and tightly knit community. This was where I belonged. So picture me, an eager, younger version of myself, slinging my rucksack onto my back and boarding a plane. From where I would be picked up by a man, an agent, holding a card with my name on it, Mr. O'Connor. Always Mr. O'Connor. Hopping into a car with this complete stranger to go somewhere unknown in search of my new family. To drive through the desert, wait in a hotel, or sit in a customs hut in some forgotten outpost, waiting to board a launch to join a ship. I didn't tell my story then to be a role model to inspire others or create change because I thought it was enough that I was standing alone holding open the door for all the females to come behind me but there was no one there because I never told them because we never told them that they could come my job at sea meant that for months at a time I disappeared from the lives of my family and friends on my first trip away, I left home and I returned five months later. There was no internet or phones as we know it today. Once a day, we dialed into the company email and we waited with bated breath to see if anyone loved us. Though it's a fleeting stay, relatively speaking, 
is a very strong camaraderie at sea, and we built connections that stood the test of time, scattered all over the globe. This place that we lived in, this other world, was surreal. It was different to what I had known, to what I'd grown up with, different to what we imagine the functioning life of a human being to be. The ocean becomes your garden, mesmerizing in its expanse. Outside of the ship, there may not be another human being for hundreds of miles. It's visceral, it's free, and it's isolating. Life slows down. You work with machinery and with men. Machinery speaks to you in a different way to humans, but it speaks to you nonetheless. It's basic working on the same principle that it has done since the creation of the engine. Power, metal on metal, pressure, movement, and fire. There's a special connection, and there's a very important relationship, but there is no emotion. There's nothing subtle, nothing empathetic, and there's nothing soft. This in ways mirrors the self-preservation of the crew. If we do not have these things, if we cannot feel, then we cannot miss the people that we've left behind. Our hearts cannot break with the isolation of the distance between us and our loved ones. The loneliness of parents passing, of babies born, and of celebrations missed. This soaks into your bones you absorb it and you live it for months until it's time to go home. And it affects you. It actually affects your being. I didn't have time to tell my story then because I had to be the best. And I had to work twice as hard to prove it so I couldn't show any weakness. But I can still feel the distinct memory of seeing a child again for the first time. Having been at sea, the airport becomes a place of marvel. Every time it surprised me that I could forget how small a child is, how small a human being could be, so pure and fragile and so delicate. And the female, a hug, a smile, a connection. A part of me that was missing returns to fill my heart. I thought that what I had been doing was difficult. Leaving, repeatedly. But when I returned from sea to the community that had raised me, it was difficult because I had been living in a completely different world. I'd spent five months living in a man's world, speaking their language, walking their walk, and I was so awkward when I suddenly landed back into the world that I had grown up in, but that had become so alien while I was gone. Mostly I learned at those times I felt that I didn't belong anywhere. Too feminine in my being, my behavior, to ever truly fit in with the boys, but too masculine in my learned behavior to comfortably go unnoticed and feel at home with the girls. But it was when I left the sea completely and came ashore to work that a lot really changed in my life. I was no longer the one who worked at sea. I had lost my routine, my identity, my status. Everything that I had worked so hard to achieve had at once disappeared. And I did not know how to deal with that. So many years had gone into building my career, my reputation, my success. And now these didn't fit into this new life. There were no ships lining the streets of Ireland and there were no suitable engineering jobs in Cork. 
on my post-recession return. So I moved to Dublin, alone, again. I definitely didn't tell my story then. To take control, to empower myself, because by then I had lost my voice. Change must happen when we realise that things are not as we would like them to be. So I retrained in my ever-growing passion of professional development. How could it be anything else? Take away my profession and I struggled with my identity. Everything about me and my value was so deeply rooted in that career. But happily now, this allows me to be the person that I needed back then to support females in STEM, science, technology, engineering and maths and other non-traditional roles where before we would not have taken a place. And today, this is where I passionately belong. When we find ourselves in a world where we're striving for connection and belonging, but we don't see anyone who looks like us, who thinks like us, when we've been separated from our old supports or feel like our life experiences have changed us. By telling our stories, we create awareness. This awareness creates change and it's this change that creates opportunity. Our stories also resonate with our tribe members opening the channels and the gates that allow them to hear us, to come to our side, to protect and support us. <laughs> Pulling all of us individuals a little bit closer. We start to create invisible networks of old and new connections, an invisible strength, a shield, and this all starts with one voice, one story. It unlocks a collective power, a force that propels us to build the foundations and the steps that we use to climb onto the shoulders of the giants that went before us so that now we can see further. Those giants that both told their story and those that didn't have a voice or a choice. So I'm telling my story now to prove that we have power within us. I'm owning my story now to show that I am powerful, that we are all powerful, even if we have not seen that yet. Maggie Kuhn told us to speak our mind even if our voice shakes. So come join me, let's tell our stories and create that change.